is no journey upon earth that a man may not make if he sets his heart to it. There is nothing that he cannot do. There are no mountains he may not climb. There are no deserts he may not cross. to open a road which runs across the river of death. There is no resting place for the weary feet, till at last the abyss swallows us, and from the shores of the transitory we are hurled into the sea of the eternal. fiction tested the limits of what you could have a person believe. His, his imagination was so vivid. When you combine that with a man who actually had gone to Africa in the pioneering days of the 1870s and 1880s, we really were blessed to, to come out with a gift from Ryder Haggard of Africa combined with this imagination. And I think it, it drew many, many people after that, both uh, filmmakers and authors. And this influence has gone on, I think, to a whole new generation indirectly in America and in many other countries by virtue, for example, of Indiana Jones. Indiana Jones is an ideal Ryder Haggard composite heroic figure. He is an um, explorer, an adventurer, an archaeologist, a romantic, a gentleman. Uh, he is Alan Quarterman, if there ever was one in film. And that has been a very strong influence on, on many young people today, I believe. Sir Henry Ryder Haggard was one of the most popular writers of the late Victorian period. Best known for his African novels, his fame spread to every corner of the empire. In Ryder Haggard's lifetime, the British Empire was very real indeed. Um, anyone in England had tremendous horizons all over the world. Um, a global horizon, if you, can, if you could have such a thing. Um, because the empire, at its height, um, included a quarter of the people on earth. And he saw, Ryder Haggard saw this as a tremendous opportunity for um, doing good, for spreading civilization. He was very idealistic about it. He wanted to be his own man and live the life that he wanted to live and to treat people in the way he saw was humanistically right. He saw clearly uh, to treat the Zulus in the way he treated them as getting the best out of them. Treading, treading on people, putting them down, making them feel insignificant, insecure, lowering self-esteem is not the way to get the best out of people. And I believe in a psychological sense that's what Ryder Haggard was about. He always believed that he was a reincarnation of an Egy ancient Egyptian priest. And most of his more successful books, or many of his more successful books, were about ancient Egypt. believed that he had lived before, as an ancient Egyptian, as a Zulu, as a Norseman. Thought I heard something on the stairs. 
can't say I'm surprised. Wouldn't want to miss this one, eh? Well, take a seat. I'm ready when you are, Squire. Israel, 1924, made in Austria, stole pictures. Classic scene, this is always a favourite. The subtitles I had to write for this was made in English, translated into German, and then back into a ludicrous, banal form of English. De Mille did it first with the Ten Commandments, but that was quite a showstopper. We're doing the whole lot, actually. Everything. Well, everything we could find. Lost a few films since your time. Don't worry. They've been making films from your books for nearly a hundred years. A hundred years? A hundred years? <laughs> so, she was immortal after all. 1900, wasn't it? The French first, did she? Is it right, sir? 1899, just one scene. But there's another one soon after. Edison Production Company, 1908. <laughs> well, a bit of a buff me, been reading your book since I was a kid. Well, that's why they chose me for this job. Wouldn't want a youngster on this one. The films of Sir Henry Ryder Haggard. That's for me, I said. Ryder was born on the 22nd of June, 1856, the eighth child in a family of ten, born to William and Ella Haggard of Bradenham Hall in the county of Norfolk. The hall being temporarily let, he arrived at Wood Farm, a small house on the estate, a circumstance said to account for his later enthusiasm for agriculture. Ryder said his father reigned at Bradenham like a king. His voice and his temper were legendary. Yet Ryder thought there was not a more popular man in the county. His mother had been brought up in India. Gentle and devoutly religious, she was also literary, writing and publishing several long poems. Twenty-two years after her death, Ryder said every one of those years brought him to a deeper appreciation of her beautiful character. In fact, he felt closer to her when she was dead than while she still lived. Between the Haggard brothers there was a strong rivalry, and Ryder seemed least likely to succeed. Astrologer Ellen Hall read his birth chart and found remarkable evidence of his character and destiny. It shows that uh, his mother, which is symbolized by the moon, was possibly a frustrated woman. Now was she sexually frustrated, and could he sense it from the time he was a very tiny child, or was she uh, an intellectual woman, uh, an unusual woman, who felt frustrated by domesticity? There seems to have been a certain amount of anger in the home atmosphere, which again he would have sensed, particularly having access, as he did, to the unconscious. And therefore my belief is that Ryder Haggard would have wanted to transmute all these difficult sexual energies which were at work within himself and he did so by writing and also he did so by becoming a political and a social reformer. It was Sir Henry Bulwer's appointment as Lieutenant Governor of Natal that triggered Ryder's destiny. William Haggard asked his neighbour to take the boy with him. Within days, Ryder was on the boat to Cape Town. Ryder Haggard, as a young man of 19, uh, went out to um, the Transvaal and worked as a young British colonial officer. And whilst he was there, um, traveling by wagon, by horseback, uh, doing his duties in the bush, um, uh, he was there for about six years, from about 19 to 25 as a young man. And he had the most remarkable series of opportunities because he, he caught the Zulu nation really at the, the end of its great period when the tribal customs were still active, when there still was a sense of um, tribal culture in its most dynamic form. And he saw 500 warriors stamping and yelling, Bayete, Bayete, with their spears in the air. 
And Ryder Haggard um, was so stunned by this, as were indeed all the earlier Victorian adventurers when they left the sort of gray mists of England. The great plains, the sparkling the torrential rivers, the sweeping thunderstorms, the grass fires creeping over the veld at night. All these things impressed me so much that were I to live a thousand years, I should never forget them. The outdoor life, the daily hardships and dangers, the friendships with older seasoned men, all these transformed Ryder and provided him with the basis for his career as a novelist. He left England a dreamy youth and returned as a man of action. Ditchingham House in Norfolk was the home of Ryder Haggard and also became the home of his youngest daughter Lilius. In 1949 Lilius was composing her own affectionate biography to be called The Cloak That I Left. And the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Do thy diligence to come shortly unto me. The cloak that I left, when thou comest, bring with thee. And the books. Especially the parchments. King Solomon's Mines. That was the book that made him famous. It happened quite by chance. Travelling up to London on the train with his brother, they started discussing Treasure Island, just then enjoying a great success. Ryder said he didn't think it was anything very remarkable, to which his brother indignantly replied, well, I'd like to see you do something half as good. I'll bet you a fop you can't. Done, said Ryder. And that evening, he sat down at his desk at Gunterston Road and began to try. It took Ryder six weeks, and when he had finished, he was entirely unaware that he had done anything remarkable that he had opened up an untried path in romantic fiction and accomplished that most difficult of fates, found something new. Now let's see what father had to say about it. I think the, the task, task occupied me about six that. weeks. When the tale was finished, I hawked it around to sundry publishers, none of whom, if I remember rightly, thought it worth bringing out. Eventually, on the recommendation of Andrew Lang, an established literary figure, Castles accepted the manuscript. They embarked on an unprecedented publicity campaign, quite remarkable for the time. Soon after publication, the firm put up posters after dark all over London. People went to their work next morning to find the message at every turning. King Solomon's Mines, the most amazing book ever written. People began to believe it. Castles had put Haggard on the literary map in one night. That initial success has been sustained through six film versions. The first, as early as 1919, was directed by Henri Lille Luco, on location with 30,000 African extras. Sir Cedric Hardwick played a definitive Alan Quatermain in the 1937 film, which included Paul Robeson as Mbopa. Then in 1950, MGM made the first colour version starring Stuart Granger, with Deborah Carr as a female lead. When was this made? Released in 1985. That's uh, Richard Chamberlain as Quatermain. Good God. And the girl? Sharon Stone. But what's she doing in the film? Oh, yeah, I see what you mean. No women in the book. <laughs> well, they changed it a bit. Box office. Plus à charge, plus à la même chose. King Solomon's mind. Oh. I always knew that book had a destiny. <laughs> Still, the filmmakers knew a good story when they read it, or rather, when they saw it. <laughs> and all in images, your books. I suppose that's why I like them. That's some of my collection up there. Too real for some people. 
I was accused of too much blood and violence. Yeah, that's in the script. As educators worried about the effects on young minds of the fighting and bloodshed, generations of schoolboys read Haggard's adventure stories after lights out. Lights out. <laughs> Boarding school, I suppose. Still, all the lads in my street read them. Alan Quatermain, here he is. Up the face of the country for greed. Me daughter is a good cook. I have a good cook. His father's a Made one to talk. Did you, Governor? Yeah, he would be. And he's a lovely writer. There were men like that in Africa in the 1870s. <laughs> I knew several. Uh, they told me their stories. But Alan was, as I used to say, myself writ large. Oh. Oh, I'd like to think I would have been had I stayed in Africa. Frederick Salou was, of course, the greatest of all the white hunters in Africa. He was the model for Alan Quatermain, Haggard's hero in King Solomon's Mines. He developed a creature after whom all the great hunters have tried to model themselves, and that includes, by the way, President Roosevelt, it includes Ernest Hemingway, and many others. But what Haggard defined in that book uh, was a man of, of adventure, of romance, of heart, and of character. Rider Haggard's contribution as a humanist to his time, or from his time in Africa, is quite interesting. And I think to some extent it goes back to his early childhood when certainly in the early days he didn't benefit from the sort of public school education that many people of his type did benefit from. And that may well have shaped his views uh, when he went to Africa. That he wanted a harmonious relationship, a harmonious time uh, with the people of the country which he loved. During Haggard's years in Africa, there was among the staff a native attendant, Um Slopagas, a Swazi of high birth. His tales of Zulu battles and mortal hand-to-hand -hand combat inspired many of Ryder's stories. Haggard said that this man had a face on his deathbed when he later saw him like a dying Greek god. He could not have had more regard for this African, nor for the Zulus, for example. And Alan Quatermain lives that way in the novels. His, his best friends are the Africans. He enjoys their culture. He respects them. And so that was something that was passed through to all these schoolboys and schoolgirls who, who read these books, and it largely continued into his films. Six films from one novel indicates the lasting appeal of King Solomon's Mines, but it does not begin to tell of the achievement of this ambitious son of a Norfolk squire. Haggard not only wrote the first novel about Africa, he also created a new type of adventure romance. His stories tumble from the pages, bizarre events, thwarted love affairs, wild coincidences, overwhelming odds against survival, battles, bloodshed, mutilation, death, destruction, and weird emanations from the world beyond. Through heroic characters, Haggard explored savage worlds, life out of time, and love everlasting. So, then came she, right? Yes and no. I quickly wrote a sequel to King Solomon's Mines, another adventure story, eventually simply called Alan Quatermain. It was the first of my novels to be serialized, which was a great advantage. But before its publication, I wrote she. I remember that when I first sat down to the task, my ideas as to its development were of the vaguest. The only clear notion I had in my head was that of an immortal woman, inspired by an immortal love. And all the rest shaped itself around this figure. And it came, it came faster than my poor aching head could set it down. The fact is, it was written at white heat, almost without rest. 1911, that one. A bit basic. Try this one. In writing She, Haggard created something very rare in literature. A new mythological figure, a new archetype. Out of the intensely masculine imperial world in which he lived, he reached into his imagination and produced the eternal, amoral, feminine Queen Asher. She who must be obeyed. Mr. Freud, and Mr. Young, the most interested in my work. I bet. Journey into the subconscious, not to mention sublimated sexual desires. <laughs> Death and sex. Now, we come to some films that you won't have seen. 1935, very stylish. Randolph Scott as an American Leo Vinci and Helen Gahagan as Asher. 
She is the doomed love story of a woman who has discovered the secret of eternal life, but kills her lover in a fit of jealousy. Two thousand years later, history repeats itself when Leo Vinci seeks to solve the mystery of immortality. On his journey to the kingdom of Kor, he falls in love with and consummates a marriage with a native woman. But in the talkies, the native is always replaced by a white heroine with whom no intercourse occurs, thus considerably changing the implications. You are his wife. No, I'm nothing to him. But he needs someone. He will not be alone. In the 1965 version, Peter Cushing plays Holly, Leo's companion, as a cross between Ryder Haggard and Alan Quatermain. Ursula Andress lends sensual beauty to the role of she, but the updated plot does little to illuminate Haggard's vision of the immortal queen. Come on then, Sir Ryder. Answer the big question. Was there someone special? You know, someone who was she? Few incidences stand out from Ryder's boyhood, but one remained fixed in his mind. It was the occasion of his eldest sister's wedding. The children amused themselves by going down to the churchyard to look for ghosts in the moonlight. No evil. No evil. No evil. To make room for the guests, he was moved to sleep in what was called the sandwich room, a little airless dressing room. The night was hot, and the celebrations had been long and exciting. In our nursery cupboard, there was a disreputable rag doll of particularly hideous aspect. Boot button eyes, hair of black wool, and a sinister leer upon its painted face. I was terrified of her. A fact soon discovered by an unscrupulous nurse who made full use of it to frighten me into obedience. It came to be called... She Who Must Be Obeyed. Just an old doll. Not quite the stuff of legend, sir. Wasn't there no one else? But Ash has sprang from another world. Another life. Not in the wastes beyond the swamp. Not there did Ash linger. Nay, not in core. But in whatever spot hearts brood o'er buried loves. There, in the tombs and deathless. An immortal love, Sir Ryder. Ida Haggard met Lily Jackson at a ball in Richmond when he was studying in London. Her only brother had been at school with one of the Haggard boys, so their families were already known to each other. But Lily was several years older than Ryder. Although she returned his love, she was not comfortable with it. 
In his second novel, The Witch's Head, Ryder fictionalized the story of their love. On she came, her lips half parted, seemingly unconscious of the admiration she was attracting, eclipsing all other women as she passed. It took but a few seconds, ten perhaps, for her to walk up the room, and yet to Ernest it seemed long before her eyes met his own, and something passed from them into his heart that remained there all his life. A Jungian psychologist has made a powerful argument about the lasting potency of this love affair. Lily became the focus of Ryder's anima, the female aspect of his soul. And he never resolved the dominance of this female personality in his life. Now, he had access to this dimension of the feminine. He was attuned to it. And from deep within himself, it fired his imagination. And Haggard was sensitive to this emergence of the feminine. Aisha's qualities of lover, she's the beautiful woman, but she's also the wise woman. She's older than him. She's got the wisdom of ages. Now, all this surged within him, picking up collective trends and ending up in this point, which in astrology symbolizes one's destiny. So he was born to write she. Hope unfulfilled. I am Hasha Motep. She. She who must be obeyed. Just like his hero Ernest in The Witch's Head, Ryder had left his true love. At his father's instigation, he had travelled out to Africa. But after two years, he wanted to come home, to become publicly engaged to Lily. She was always with him. For in truth, their very natures were interwoven. For the real life is not here. Here is only the blind beginning of things, maybe the premature beginning. His father wrote to Ryder, forbidding him to give up his position. The terms of the letter were so harsh as to entirely crush Ryder's pride and hopes. He destroyed the letter on the spot. He did not come home. He stayed on and was selected to become master and registrar of the High Court. Ryder and the judge have gone long circuits to the interior, dispensing justice in isolated communities. He used to say they were some of the happiest days of his life in Africa. Then Lily wrote to tell Ryder that she was marrying someone else. William Haggard tried to make amends by offering Lily a home until Ryder returned, but it was too late. She bowed to pressure from her family and married the executor of her late father's fortune. When Ryder eventually came back to England in 1879, he met my mother, Mariana Louisa Margetson. They were engaged within a week, but not married until the following year. Knowing that Ryder was penniless and that he would take Louis out to his farm in Newcastle, her uncle opposed the union, and Louis was an heiress. The heiress to Ditchingham. In the autumn of 1880, Ryder and Louis sailed out to Africa and started their married life on his farm in Natal. Their first child, Jock, was born in May 1881, but as the First Boer War developed, Ryder decided it was no place for a family. They returned home, and although Ryder always hankered after colonial life, he set his mind to the study of law and was duly called to the bar. For various periods, Ditchingham House was let, while the Haggard family, with the addition of two little girls, lived in London. And it was during this period that Ryder began writing novels. With success in his grasp, he abandoned the law, and they returned to Norfolk. Perhaps domesticity had begun to pall, or perhaps Ryder, still a young man, longed for the action of his days in Africa. Perhaps Ryder and Louis wanted to do something together without the family. Whatever the reason, in 1890, Ryder and Louis embarked on what, at best, may be called a wildly romantic quest. With their friends the Jebs, they decided to undertake a treasure hunt for the Aztec gold which Cortez had lost in his retreat from Mexico City. It was as though Ryder wanted to live one of his own novels. Ryder and Louis arranged for the children to stay with friends, the girls remained together, 
but Jock went to the family of Edmund Goss, the writer and literary critic. On the 31st of January, 1891, Goss wrote to his friend in America, the Ryder Haggards leaving, as probably you know, for Mexico, we took in their son Jock, a very intelligent boy, about the size of our Philip. He brought germs of the measles with him, and he and our two youngest verily developed the disease. A few days before, Nellie had told Tessa, had written to her daughter, that they were all going on very well with carbolic baths and different pleasant entertainments of a similar kind. So it seemed that uh, Philip and Sylvia and Jock had got through the measles and all was well. But just, just over a week later, uh, Jock Haggard died. And he died, I looked up his death certificate, and he died in fact in a nursing home in Kensington of uh, uh, peritonitis following a perforated gastric ulcer which is not a possible complication of measles and I talked to my doctor about it and he thought it was possible and indeed quite likely that the uh, peritonitis, the perforated ulcer, had been caused by swallowing this carbolic bath. Fortunately, uh, I think that neither the Gosses nor the Haggards ever realised this. I mean, it was you know, a terribly tragic thing the boy was dead and the Haggards were cabled in Mexico with the news that he had passed peacefully away. It was extraordinary. The bitterness of his loss grew almost unbearable. In those spring days, Ryder learned how terrible a thing it can be to love the dead. For the valley of shadow of death, I shall fear no evil. Yea, though I walk through the valley of shadow of death, I shall fear no evil. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil. Oh! <laughs> Why? Why? Jack! Jack! Refusing all consolation, he shut himself up at Ditching. Everything that Jock possessed was put away his books on the highest shelf in the library, his toys in cupboards or hidden in the loft, his letters, every one he had ever written, locked away in his desk. Even his small sisters realized that Jock's name must never pass their lips within their father's hearing. As the months went by, Ryder became physically a very sick man. In his grief, Ryder saw Jock's death as a punishment for his own sins. His agony was underlined by the fact that he had known when he set out for Mexico that disaster lay ahead. The death of Ryder's son gave a very good example of Ryder's psychic powers. Ryder went to say goodbye and he was so overcome by a, a dreadful feeling that he would never see the boy again that he had to rush from the room before he burst into tears. But he always thought that he was going to die rather than his son. In his obsession, Ryder forgot that Louis too had lost a child. On December 9th, 1892, just three years to the day, almost to the hour, that Ryder's mother had left him. His youngest child was born. Disappointingly for Ryder and Louis, the baby was a girl. Oh, my dear, I always knew. But Ryder loved children. He called me Lilius, and from the time of my birth, his health began to improve. After several years shut away at Ditchingham, Haggard emerged with fresh ambitions. He wanted to enter public life and consciously developed associations with politicians and statesmen, men involved in world affairs. But it was his friendship with Rudyard Kipling which most reflected his interest in the aspirations of Britain and the Empire. Kipling and Ryder Haggard saw the Empire in slightly different ways. Both had been out on the frontiers of the Empire, Kipling in India, Ryder Haggard in Africa. The difference was that Kipling had been a journalist and he'd observed 
the, the men of action in the empire. And he would admired them greatly. Now Ryder Haggard, as he saw him, was one of those men of action. And he was a very striking looking fellow, very tall, rangy, bright eyed character, larger than life, whereas Kipling was rather slight and, and rather bookish looking. Um, and he admired this um, uh, buccaneering um, author who'd be, who really had done the things that he himself only wrote about. Now Ryder Haggard, went far beyond that. Even that was too constricting for him. He had, of course, in his fiction, invented extraordinary worlds of his own. But when dealing with the empire, he thought beyond it, what was going to happen to it, how it could evolve. Um, and Kipling never went really as far as that. He took it as it was. Kipling and I wrote The Ghost Kings together, and we talked about the world, the war, about reincarnation, spiritualism, psychic experiences. He once said to me, he said, there are only telephone wires. You didn't write she, you know. Something wrote it through you. He told me that he could work as well when I was sitting in the room as when he was sitting alone. And I'd take my work to Bateman's on my way back from St. Leonard's, or he'd bring his to Kessingland, or Ditchingham. So, you got your house in Redcliffe Square, and the Grange at Kessingland, and the gatehouse at St. Leonard's on Sea. Yes, and I was able to farm properly, at least until the war, when things became quite impossible. I travelled widely, involved myself in public life, donating my time. But I had a dream, or rather a nightmare, in which I was doomed to write romances forever. middle years, Ryder Haggard seized hold of a new realism. He wrote historical novels, which he researched assiduously, and he embarked on a political career. He stood as a conservative or unionist in East Norfolk in 1895, and he nearly won the seat, but he hated politics. He, he, um, it was a pretty rough election campaign, and, um, and he hated the slanging and the bad manners. Was, he was very much um, a traditional, rather old-fashioned um, English gentleman at heart. I suppose Ryder Haggard was a failure as a politician in many respects, and that he was, in his, in his own words, the, the archetypal crossbencher, the crossbench MP, who was really interested and concerned about what was right and what was proper for people, which is what politics is about, rather than serving the needs of uh, the party. Uh, the fact that he concentrated on people and the production of, uh, of food and agricultural practice, generally being a good friend of, uh, of a number of agricultural pioneers, particularly in Norfolk with uh, Arthur Young and Cook, uh, following, uh, he particularly responded to the techniques which they put forward in their days. And I believe that is one of Ryder Haggard's further hallmarks to greatness. Because of his great energy, his own small farm wasn't enough for him. So he, he branched out in, and, and was, became interested in um, farming in East Anglia and then all over England. 
And as a result of this, and he was a, a compulsive writer, he um, um, wrote a book called um, A Farmer's Year, which was a, a diary of, uh, of his own year on his own farm. And then he expanded the idea to do a massive work called Rural England, which was about farming all over the country. Why the hell was... Uh didn't was not a farmer. He didn't know. He had the feel of farming. He didn't really know much about farming. And when he wanted any technical get, he very important to get it right in his books. And when he wanted any sort of farming thing, be it from a book, or or he was on the way to the Min of Ag to give him a good advice about the countryside, he would check his facts. And he liked people like my father to tell him the background to what he was going to say. But agriculture, and indeed rural life, was soon to change beyond recognition. The countries of Europe were already on course for war. Haggard was in Canada in 1914, beginning his work on the Dominion's Royal Commission. This had to be abandoned. He then served on the Royal Commonwealth Society Committee to organize resettlement of soldiers and sailors. Despite his success in obtaining guarantees of land, the British government barely recognized his contribution. Back in Norfolk, Ryder, sickened by the government's domestic regulations, sold his livestock and gave up the lease on his farmland. I've got that film of you at Ditchingham. I bet you were pleased with this when they made it. Oh yes, I was. You can see my spaniel, Cheeky. I thought it made me look even older than I was. My grandfather died when I was eight. And up till then, I lived at Kessingland, 20 miles away. And occasionally I came over, uh, as did many of the ne nephews and nieces, usually pe penniless, and staying long times, uh, uh, enjoying my grandparents' hospitality. Um, in fact, the house, there are so many of them, the house became known as uh, the stray dog's home. Uh, on one occasion, I do recall, in uh, fact, the first occasion as I came over, I came down to breakfast and the servants were lined up round the dining room, preparatory to my grandfather taking prayers. And we said the Lord's Prayer, but I was sitting on my grandfather's left and uh, I was far too scared to open my mouth. And after the prayers were over, he leant over to me and he said, with a kindly glint in his eye, he said, what's the matter with you, boy? You can't tie up your own shoelaces, you can't read the time, you eat like a pig, and you don't know the Lord's Prayer. Well, I don't refute the first three accusations, but I did know the Lord's Prayer, but I was far too scared to speak. By the 1920s, Ryder was still prolific although his later books lacked some of the early vitality. But the film business was beginning to get off the ground. His stories were finding a new audience. Fader Berra. <laughs> the Vamp, they called her. She played Jess, you know. Mm -hmm. Lost film, Jess. So is this one. Cleopatra, one of her greatest. <laughs> well, Lost, the cellulose nitrate deteriorates. The films also become highly flammable, which can be a problem. I think Fox Studios had a fire. Anyway, there's only a snippet left somewhere. That film was based on my novel, Cleopatra, which I had written in 1899 after my second trip to Egypt. Fox wouldn't admit it. Yeah? Well, it was quite something. Um, some of the massive exteriors were built, built in, in Fox's Fox Los Angeles studio. But Fox also rebuilt the pyramids and the Sphinx in a desert area of California. And he reconstructed a stretch of the Nile River just outside Los Angeles, complete with the waterfront of Alexandria. The inventive advertising campaign included the memorable comment from Mark Antony, it was great while it lasted. It was said that the film grossed a million dollars. I was ready to sue for plagiarism, and they knew it. Eventually, Fox settled, out of court, for several thousand pounds. The extravagance of Hollywood was never more lavish than when MGM gave King Solomon's Mines the ultimate treatment. 
Three years in the making, it was shot on location in Technicolor. The impact was sensational. It opened in New York at Radio City Music Hall, which of course is the greatest American cinema palace. And I couldn't believe when the screen opened up, and for the first time in my life, I saw Africa alive, in color, wall to wall in this vast hall, with stampeding animals, elephants and zebra and giraffe and gazelle, and a hunter, and Africans, and tribal dances. And it really made you want to go. You really could smell it. It was a very, very powerful film. Luco. Remember him? But of course, Foggy Chap. Is he here? Topped himself after 1925, she. Hmm. Money. Always was money with Luco. In debt up to the gills. I used to wonder if the cinema business would ever be adequately handled in this country. It should be in the hands of artists, strictly honourable, upright men. Still, you did all right out of it. Go and sit yourself down in there. You'll enjoy this. Luco's last film. We got a print from Mr. David. Mr. David Samuelson. <laughs> I expect you knew his father. She must have been quite a production, because when you think about it, all our lives, Daddy used to speak about it, Mummy used to speak about it, and the legends that have grown up around it over all the years, sort of high on the list, I often think, if you could have your ancestors back for, for one day a year, what questions would you ask them? Absolutely. And she has got to be very high on that list. When you think of it, and you look at that still, it was a big production. It was a three-camera job. Two Debris and a Bell and Howe. Sidney Blythe brought over from Britain, chief cameraman. And, of course, they brought Betty Blythe over from America, from Hollywood. And she was a big star then, and became a much bigger star subsequently. So that it really did make it a very major production. Maybe you lived before, and maybe you didn't. But we haven't seen the last of you. Too good a storyteller. Ryder Haggard, who was on every boy's lips when I was a boy, and everybody who got sixpence to spend on a book bought a Ryder Haggard book. They don't know he ever existed. Now, to me, that is sad. Two, two things, because he was a great romantic and he was a great advisor to governments. He, he was a marvellous man. There are not many authors who would listen, be listened by governments all around the world as he was. There by the graveside of the body of the dead, there in the red light of the morning amidst the lonely snows, celebrated the strangest marriage the world has ever seen. Only in death could Ryder find union with Lily. At her funeral, he remembered the girl with the golden hair and the violets in her hand. His love for her transcended time and death itself. This was the essence of she. Ryder turned and left the dead to their sleep. A few months before he died, Ryder gave a speech about the power of the imagination. He said it was the hidden power of the spirit which connected the visible to the invisible and which heard the voice of the infinite. Ryder Haggard heard that voice and through it fulfilled Andrew Lang's accolade, 
King Romance is come indeed. My father, in fact, was with him the night before he died in a London nursing home, and there was a big blaze fairly close to the nursing home, and the light came in, and my grandfather rose up in bed, and the light reflected off his face, and my father said to himself, My God, an old pharaoh. Sir Henry Ryder Haggard, Esquire of Ditchingham, Master of the High Court of the Transvaal, Special Commissioner, reporting Chairman of the Royal Commission on Coastal Rome, Member of the Empire Settlement Committee, Member of the Dominion's Royal Commission on Sir Henry Ryder Haggard, born 1856, best-selling author of 58 novels, Sir Henry Ryder Haggard, died 1925, aged 69.